Today we've got a nice problem from the 2009 Putnam exam, and this is problem B5. And if you're not aware, the problems on the exam, A1 through A6, the morning session, and B1 through B6, are generally ordered in order of difficulty. So A1 and B1 are the easiest, A2 and B2 are next easiest, and so that means that B5 should probably be one of the more difficult problems on the exam. Of course, they don't always get it perfect in the ordering, but that's the general rule. And I guess the takeaway from this, if you're studying for your first Putnam exam, is to focus on a lot of the A1 and A2 problems and B1 and B2 problems. And when it comes to test day, maybe focus on trying to solve those. But that being said, we're going to look at B5 today. Okay, so let's see what we have here. Let's suppose we've got a function f, which goes from the open interval 1 infinity to the real numbers, and it satisfies the following differential equation. And that is that its derivative, f prime, is equal to x squared minus f of x quantity squared, over x squared times 1 plus f of x squared. And then our goal is to show that the limit as x goes to infinity of f of x is in fact infinity. And there are a couple of like standard solutions to this problem, but we're adapting it from this solution by Catalan Zara. Okay, so let's get to it. The main idea behind this solution is to use some accessory functions that are maybe built out of the function f of x. And in this case, we'll set our function g of x, our first accessory function, to be x plus the function f of x. Okay, but notice that we can invert this assignment and what will we get? Well, we'll pretty obviously get f of x is equal to g of x minus x. Okay, so notice our only tool here is this differential equation for f. So we should probably use this to get a differential equation for g, and that's exactly what we'll do. So let's notice that g prime of x is equal to, well, one, plus f prime of x. But we'll use this version of f prime of x. So we'll have x squared plus f of x squared. Sorry, that should be minus f of x squared. But I'll replace f of x with g of x minus x. So now my numerator looks like this. I have x squared minus f of x squared, but it's really g of x minus x squared. That's because we want to write this differential equation completely in terms of g. And then my denominator will be x squared times, well, we'll have 1 plus my f of x quantity squared, which we'll use g of x here. So this will be g of x minus x quantity squared. So we've got something like this. And now I want to look at this term that we're adding on to the number one. And that brings us to our first claim. And that claim is that this object is always strictly bigger than negative one. Now, how might this help? Well, if this object is always strictly bigger than negative one, maybe I'll notate that by putting this blue box here, is strictly bigger than negative one, then that will pretty quickly give us that g prime of x is always bigger than zero, which means that g of x is strictly increasing, and in turn, every strictly increasing has a limit as x goes to infinity. So the limit of g of x as x goes to infinity exists. It may be infinite, but it exists. Okay, so let's maybe box this off over here. That's the reason that we want to show that this blue box stuff is bigger than negative one. That's maybe the payoff. Okay, so let's do that. And we'll do that by, well, starting with the inequality that we want. 
and then reducing it to something that's obviously true. So let's just copy this thing down. So we've got x squared minus, then we have g of x minus x quantity squared over x squared times one plus g of x minus x quantity squared. I think I forgot a parentheses here. There we have it. So if this is bigger than negative one, then that's equivalent to what we get by cross multiplying. In other words, x squared minus, you know, I've got my g of x minus x quantity squared, which is bigger than, now I've got minus x squared, and then minus x squared times g of x minus x squared where what I did is I took this x squared and I distributed it through to both of these terms and then multiplied by the negative one by the cross multiplication. Okay, great. But now let's collect some terms. So let's, for instance, take this negative x squared, move it over to the left-hand side of the inequality, and then we'll take this bit right here, this g of x minus x quantity squared, and move it over to the right side of the inequality. So over on the left side of the inequality, now we'll have 2x squared, and then that will be bigger than, well, we'll have a g of x minus x quantity squared, but every term that's now on the right-hand side has that as a factor, so we can factor it out. We'll be left with one minus x squared. So the one from this pink underline term and the x squared from what we already have on the right-hand side of the equation. But now we're essentially done if we look at this carefully. So notice that this 2x squared term is always strictly bigger than 2. Well, we know that because x is strictly bigger than 1, given that we're on this interval from 1 to infinity. And then notice that this object right here is something squared. So since it's something squared, it's always bigger than or equal to zero. You cannot achieve a negative number by squaring it, at least in the real numbers here. And then here we've got this one minus x squared term, but let's notice that this is less than zero. And again, the fact that that's less than zero follows from the fact that x is bigger than one. So let's notice the right-hand side is always bigger than two, whereas this left-hand side, by the multiplicative rules, is always less than zero. So that means this inequality holds, but this inequality is equivalent to the one above, which is equivalent to our goal inequality. But let's recall the whole point of this goal inequality gave us the fact that the derivative of g was always positive, which means that g of x is a strictly increasing function, which means that the limit of g of x exists. It may be infinite though. So let's go ahead and prove that, well, it is in, in fact infinite. Okay, so we just got done proving that the limit as x goes to infinity of g of x exists. It may be infinite though. Now we'll prove that it is in fact infinite. And the proof will go via contradiction. So by way of contradiction, let's suppose that the limit as x goes to infinity of g of x is equal to, well, some number which is less than infinity. Maybe I'm going to use the number capital G just to bring it in line with G of X. Okay, and now let's observe the following calculation. So if this limit of X going to infinity of G of X is less than infinity, then that tells us that the limit as X goes to infinity of G prime of X must be equal to zero. Okay, well, I think that is a standard rule from calculus or real analysis, that if you have a finite infinite limit, and when I say finite infinite limit, I mean that the limit is finite, but your uh, variable is approaching infinity, then the limit of the derivative has to be equal to zero. That's, of course, assuming everything is differentiable. 
Notice otherwise we would just have infinite growth forever and ever and ever if this limit was not zero. Recall that g prime was always positive. Okay, but then likewise, this is equal to the limit as x goes to infinity of, well, this blue, well, one plus this blue boxed thing. And well, that's because we have this expression for g of x. So let's write this one plus then I'm gonna simplify this blue box thing by multi or multiplying the numerator and the denominator by one over x squared. That's gonna give me with one minus g of x over x minus one squared in the numerator. And then in the denominator, what will I have? Well, I'm gonna have something like this. One plus x squared times g of x over x minus one quantity squared. Again, that's just by some algebraic manipulation. Okay, great, now where are we gonna go from here? Well, since the limit of g of x is finite, well then that means that this bit right here, this g of x over x approaches zero as x approaches infinity. Because the numerator is just approaching a number, whereas the denominator is approaching infinity. And then likewise, that's occurring down here as well. So here, that's going to zero. But let's see, what's that leaving us with? Well, that leaves us with one minus one in the numerator, and then, well, the denominator's approaching infinity. So this whole thing here, this thing that I'm like putting this bracket red over, approaches zero. But then that means that this limit is equal to one. But of course that's a problem because we've just built the equation zero is equal to one. And that is indeed our contradiction. Contradicting the fact that we assumed we have a finite limit, so that means we in fact have an infinite limit. Okay, now let's go to the next step. So we just got done proving that if you set g of x equal to x plus f of x, then the infinite limit of g of x is infinity. And then using very, very similar calculations, if you introduce a new function h of x equal to x minus f of x, then its infinite limit is also infinity. And maybe we'll leave that as a bit of a homework exercise. Okay, now where can we go from here? Well, we're gonna use the precise definition of these infinite limits to give us like a test value of x to work with. Okay, so this means that there exists a number that I'll call x naught, which is, well, it's gotta be bigger than one, given the fact that that's our domain here, such that um, g of x is bigger than zero and h of x is also bigger than zero. That's because if the limits are infinite, then we can choose an x value for whenever we're above that x value, so here let's say x is bigger than x naught, we're as big as we wanna be. So in this case, as big as we wanna be only needs to be the number zero, but I could exchange this zero for any large number I wanted to. But like I just said, all we need here is the number zero. Okay, so what does that tell us? Well, for all x bigger than x naught, we have x plus f of x is bigger than zero, and x minus f of x is bigger than zero. Okay, well, let's maybe solve these inequalities for f of x. So this means that f of x is bigger than negative x, and then f of x is less than x. But now we can put these two together into a compound inequality. So we have negative x is less than f of x is less than x. But now we can square all parts of this and well, that'll turn it into the following new compound inequality. We have zero is less than or equal to f of x quantity squared, which is less than x squared. So of course, if we square, we bound it below by zero kind of automatically. But now observe what that means. That means that x squared minus f of x quantity squared is always bigger than zero. And that's actually maybe the most important inequality to like take us home here. 
Now let's look at our derivative. So let's note that we have f prime of x is equal to what? Well, it's x squared minus f of x squared over x times f of x squared plus one, just by our given differential equation. But observe that this blue box um, calculation that we made tells us that this numerator is always bigger than zero. But then down here, that should be an x squared, we know that this denominator is also always bigger than zero. Well, how do we know that? Well, it's something squared plus one, so that something squared plus one is always bigger than one, and then it's x squared. Well, that x squared is always bigger than one as well because x is bigger than one. So actually, we could exchange this down here for bigger than the number one if we wanted to, but the important thing here is that this is bigger than zero. But let's see what that means. If f prime is always bigger than zero, that means f is an increasing function, which again, by the technique that we use to show that g of x has a limit, that means that the limit as x goes to infinity of f of x exists. It may be infinite, but it exists. Okay, now the one last thing we need to prove is that not only may it be infinite, but it is infinite, as that's the goal here. So using our accessory functions, we showed that f prime was always positive, but that shows that the limit exists, the limit that we're looking for, but it may be positive infinity. Now we wanna finish with the claim proving that it is in fact positive infinity. So we're gonna prove this by way of contradiction and we're gonna get a contradiction that is very, very similar to the one that we did when we proved the limit is g of x is infinity, which is similar to the one that you would have seen for h of x too if you do the homework. Okay, so by way of contradiction, let's suppose that the limit as x goes to infinity of f of x equals the number l, which is less than infinity. And now let's see where this goes. So this is gonna tell us that the limit as x goes to infinity of f prime of x is zero. Again, that's because, well, f prime was always positive, which means we have always a strictly increasing function. And if the limit is not zero, well, then we would have an infinite limit, but we're uh, supposing that we have a finite limit. Okay, now let's see where this takes us. This turns into the limit as x goes to infinity of what? We have um, x squared times one minus f of x over x quantity squared. What did I do there? Well, I factored an x squared out of the numerator. And actually, let's use that to cancel the x squared in the denominator while we're at it. That'll leave us with what? One plus f of x quantity squared in the denominator. So I just did some really simple simplification. Okay, now what's going on here? So f of x is trending towards a finite value. x is trending towards an infinite value. That means this whole thing here is trending towards zero. Whereas this f of x squared here is trending towards l squared. That tells us that this limit is in fact one over one plus l squared. But notice that l squared, well, it's gonna be a finite number that's, well, less than infinity. But then squaring it, we know that l squared is gonna be bigger than zero. I think that's pretty obvious. But if L squared is bigger than zero, then that means this denominator here is a positive number. But well, all we really need to know is the fact that this whole object here is bigger than zero. But of course that's a problem because what we have just shown is that zero is strictly bigger than zero. That is a contradiction. But what did we contradict? Well, we contradicted this assumption that we had a finite limit. But if that's a contradiction or if that led to a contradiction, then that means that we must have an infinite limit. But that's exactly what we wanted to show in the end. And that's a good place to stop. 
Thanks for watching and sticking around until the end of the video. And since you're here, don't forget to gently press that like button, subscribe, ring the bell, and select all notifications to never miss a video. If you want to get your name in the credits like you see here, access the live seminar series, review videos before release, and more, go to patreon.com slash michaelpenmath and become a Patreon member today. If you want full ad-free course content, subscribe to my second channel, Math Major. I've got courses on linear algebra, complex analysis, and proof writing, among several others. And that's everything. Bye.